Microcontrollers, love them or hate them, they're pretty much a part of every electronics design these days. And the thing about microcontrollers is they've got software in them, and as soon as you've got software, you've got bugs, or certainly the potential for bugs. Or if you haven't got bugs, you want to upgrade the, the user to some new functionality and maybe introduce a few bugs in the process. One common feature on pretty much all microcontrollers these days is a certain known as self-programming, which basically means that the program running on the microcontroller can reprogram parts of its own program memory. This is a very handy facility because it means that you can update the firmware using whatever memory interface or communications pathway your product just happens to have anyway, or maybe something that's put in there specifically for programming. But the point is, the user can update it in the field, they don't need to buy a special programmer and plug it in to update the software. Now the way this update is normally done, if we look at the memory map of a typical microcontroller, normally what happens when the program starts, it starts off at reset and runs the, um, your main application code. To perform updates in the field, the, the general way of doing it is to put a piece of code generally regards a bootloader, normally in the top of memory. Quite a few microcontrollers have some explicit support for this. For example, they have a write protected area at the top. Um, devices, for example, like the 80 Mega Series, can actually redirect the, the reset vector so that when it resets, it actually resets into the bootloader. The bootloader can then decide whether or not we're going to be doing a software update. If we are, the bootloader can then rewrite the application memory, and if not, it can just jump back into the application code. One advantage of this reset vector thing is the application code doesn't actually need to know anything at all about the presence of the bootloader, so um, a good example of this is the Arduino um, which uses this system. So your application code just thinks it's running in a standalone micro, but what it doesn't know is that the bootloader is actually run before the main application code and the bootloader will make a decision, um, for example, it may look at the state of an external pin to decide I'm going to go into bootloader mode, or it may be on communication. Now, this traditional type of bootloader tends to communicate with something like a PC um, over some sort of serial link, or serial via USB. The key thing about this is that the protocol that this uses um, is simple. And because it's a simple protocol, it means it doesn't take a great deal of code to implement. So um, the bootloader is typically very small, maybe a couple of hundred bytes, a couple of hundred words, depending on your architecture. Um, there's a few reasons why you want the bootloader to be small. Firstly, obviously, you don't want the bootloader to be taking up space that you could be using for your application. But also, the smaller the code, the code is, the less likely it is to have bugs, because there's just less space for the, those bugs, bugs to be there. Because the thing, generally speaking, about the bootloader is you can't update it in the field easily. Now, OK, it might actually be possible to perhaps download a special application code whose sole purpose is to rewrite the bootloader. Um, that's sometimes possible, but if you're making use of things like the right protection facilities when the boot bootloader, that's not um, really practical. So generally you want to work on the assumption the bootloader will never change. It's, it's there for good, but the bootloader can program any other part of the system as required. In addition to going on reset, sometimes you might actually want the application to also be able to jump into the bootloader. For example, if you've got some user menu that prompts the user, you're now going to go up and update the software. But generally, you, you tend to want to run the bootloader on reset so that it's fairly bulletproof. So if you get a failed software update, it's always there, and you can always just restart it and reprogram your application. Now, that's all very fine. If you've got an interface like a serial, which is really yeah, a simple-to-implement protocol, that's actually pretty straightforward. It works fine. Lots of applications use it and, it, and it works really nicely. One problem, though, is where your interface um, isn't as simple as serial. For example, it could be perhaps a memory card interface, maybe USB sticks, Bluetooth, perhaps. Maybe you've got some sort of wireless interface in there, doing either some sort of standard or uh, custom protocol. Maybe perhaps a cellular modem, something like that, for uh, longer distance communication. Or maybe even something like Wi-Fi or Ethernet. NFC, perhaps. Now, the issue with all these protocols is they're a lot more complex to implement than something like an RS-232 interface. If you want to implement these protocols in your bootloader, your bootloader can start getting quite big. Because, for example, let's say, for example, the USB stick, um, you've got sort of the USB, and then you've got maybe some sort of FAT filing system to be able to read the files off the card. So you're starting to have to have quite a lot in the bootloader. If it's Ethernet, you've maybe got TCP IP stack up here. So this is starting to take up quite a lot of memory. So we have these issues of, A, it's starting to intrude into the space you, you've got for your application. Um, but secondly, also, the more stuff you've got here, the more likely there is to be a bug in it, which is really bad if you can't update it. Now there are a few solutions to this. Um, the chances are that yeah, the reason that you want to use, let's say, USB stick for update is your application is using that USB um, 
functionality as part of, you know, a part of its reason for being a product. So I mean, one approach could be you have your USB and FAT library in some sort of dedicated area in the bootloader and your application code can actually make use of it. So you don't have to duplicate the functionality because if, if it's just a dedicated bootloader, that functionality is going to be duplicated here. So you've basically got the two, you know, two copies of the same code almost doing the same thing. Okay, this can be stripped down to be read only and so on, but you've still got quite a lot of code here. So in one way around would be to have like some sort of standard library that's used by the bootloader and by the application, but that gets pretty complicated. It's doable, but the application has to know exactly what's where, and you've got to manage all the entry points, and you've got to have all sorts of weird linker configurations to make sure everything's in the right place. You've got to allocate the space everywhere. The other thing to consider is if you're implementing quite a complex communications protocol in your bootloader, um, it's quite a lot of development effort because chances are you're not writing your own USB stack and TCP IP stack. You're, you know, you're using somebody else's so you have to be familiar enough with it to know how to incorporate it into this special area, maybe strip out the bits you don't need. So you know, there's quite a big development effort in doing this. But secondly, that, element, that development effort is pretty much dedicated to that communications interface. So if it's USB, that code that you've written is only going to be usable for USB. And if you need to do Ethernet some other time, that code is only going to be usable for Ethernet. Right, so how do we solve this problem? Right, so this is a solution that I've used in quite a few applications. Um, I wouldn't claim it's sort of super original, super clever. Um, it's just another way of doing things that might be of interest if you've, um, if you've not come across it before. Um, I'd call this like an intermediate memory bootloader. So instead of having this boot your bootloader up here that's handling the whole update process, most of the job is actually now done by the application code. The trick is that your application code will already have the um, ability to do Let, let's say for example we're doing it with a USB stick so we have our application we have our USB port on there and we we have the code in here that's doing our USB and our FAT library everything that's needs to be to talk to this USB if it was Ethernet then this would be your TCP PRP stack your Ethernet drivers but you know your, your complicated fiddly bit of code that you don't really want to mess about with too much if you can help it so in this model, the way it works is this, we, in addition to our main program, we have some other piece of memory which is big enough to hold a complete application image. Now this could be a number of different things. It could be um, an externally squared PROM, which your application might already have. It could be perhaps Flash. Um, for example, the SPI Flash chips are really cheap. You can get 4 megabit chip for about 50p these days. It could be maybe um, external SRAM. If your application is fairly small, it could even actually be a spare area of the main program memory. Um, if it's very small, it could even be your internal RAM. But what happens is this. The application decides, OK, I'm going to do a firmware update, for, pr by, prompted by some user ac action, that doesn't matter what. What it does is it takes, it talks to the USB stick, or let, let's just say USB stick for now, and it copies the firmware image into this external memory. It can then verify, it can do whatever, it may be if you want to do encryption, you can do encryption, decryption, whatever here. But the point is that it's under the control of the application, making use of its existing library, and in many cases using its existing peripherals, whether it's USB stick, flash, whatever. It's, t it's made a copy of the new application code somewhere safe. Now the key is that this area is now really simple and easy to access. You need very little code to be able to take this code and then copy it into the new application load area. So what happens is once it's copied it in here, it's verified, it knows it's definitely a good application, it's done whatever it needs to do to say, right, I'm happy to, to update the firmware with this new image. It then makes a call to a really small amount of code, let's call this copy, because it's not really a bootloader, um, and all that c code has to do is copy the data from this external memory, let's say it's the E squared PROM, into the application area. Um, it doesn't need to know anything at all about these protocols. It means that this is a very simple piece of code, and I've implemented this down to about 32 words on a one extreme example. Um, all it needs to know is basically where this code is and how big it is, and it can then make the copy, it can then reset itself, and yet you're up and running with the new firmware. Not only is it very small, there's very little code, minimal chance of bugs because the code's so small. But the other nice thing about it is that you don't need to change it. You know, if you have a completely different application on the same processor, say one using Ethernet, one using USB, this doesn't need to change at all. 
all it needs to know is where this image is. So it could be externally squared, it could be a, an area of the main um, program space. This actually, you know, not, not only does it reduce the amount of space used by um, the copy code, it also really simplifies your development process because you, know, you're, you're, you already know how to deal with your, let's say, USB or Ethernet interface, so you know that. You know how to talk to your screen, so you know that. So for the effort involved in you to write the code to copy from your complicated media onto your let's call it easy media you've you know it's simple it's not something you've got to dig through umpteen weird compiler options to be able to do you can write that all in c quite happily very easy and even this code up here you know if you want to you can probably write it in c but it's so small that it's not a big deal if you even have to write it in assembly if you don't really want to fight the compiler into persuading it um to locate the code there now obviously there are one or two small um potential risks uh, in this strategy. One risk is if you get a power outage during this copy process then you end up with a corrupt application. Now there are two mitigations for this. The first is this copy process is quick. I mean it depends a lot on the flash write time on the microcontroller but it can, it can often be under one second so your actual window of potential disaster is very small to start with and if you're particularly paranoid about it um, let's say for example you're using an external SPI flash which is really cheap it's cheap enough to dedicate that to you could actually store within that a known good firmware image so you could actually have not so much a bootloader but almost like a boot checker which is always called on reset this checks the integrity of your application code if it thinks there's something wrong with it like say there's a bad checksum or there's a tag that says I was you know maybe this process actually puts a marker somewhere that says I've started to make a copy and then clears it when it's finished so this this um, reset code can actually tell that something went wrong. It can then copy from its known good thing into the application area that, that then restores this functionality to, to then have another go. The other main risk of course is if you download bad application code so that it passes all, any checking process and you still manage to download application code that then can't talk um, to this interface. Well, I mean, yes, that is a, a, you know, a brick situation, but it's your own stupid fault because you should have tested the code before issuing it, you know, releasing it. So um, that's not really an, in, you know, although it is a risk, it's a risk that, that's you know, quite easily mitigated. And obviously, this, you know, this isn't the right solution for a lot of applications, but for certainly where you've got a complex communication to your the media on which your new firmware comes, is that it can actually work out a really nice solution. Even, for example, if you need to, to use a bigger microcontroller, just maybe to, to stick to have enough space to store that image, or if you, yeah. But a lot of the time, you'll actually have that space almost for free. If you're using SPI Flash or Big E squared, you know, the chances are you've actually got that space all there for free. So this is you know, like a zero cost way of adding you know, in the field firmware updates with relatively low risk, but also without needing to have either large amounts of code in your bootloader that need a lot of development time or in the case of the more traditional serial uh, bootloader um, that's going to be talking to let's say PC or whatever you know you've got to write code to sit on here to do the upgrade process as well so that's another another effort so in terms of development effort this is actually quite a nice solution because you know the copy process is easy that's really easy the only tricky bit is actually get, getting your head around the actual flash write process um, on the micro which obviously differs from micro to micro but once you've done that once that's it that same piece of code can be used on pretty much any micro in that family there might be minor differences in memory but that same piece of code um, can be used for all your projects yeah you know, even even if you're using different interfaces the only difference is where this thing's getting its code from so in a lot of cases it's, yeah, it's worth thinking of giving a slight, slightly bit of lateral thinking away from the standard bootloader architecture and just by using you know, having that extra piece of memory somewhere which you know you might already have for free anyway but even if you don't it can actually be worth adding it say fit a 50p external SPI flash the cost of that compared to the development effort of doing some really complicated bootload would easily pay itself back unless it's a very high volume product one of the final little hint when you're actually writing this code obviously the process of writing code that overrides the main application is sort of fraught with difficulty you know you will have bugs you will trash everything and it takes a few passes to get it right one really handy hint though is when you're doing development get this to instead of obviously you can develop all the code that does the copy process to your memory obviously you can de develop and debug that you can read back that memory check that it's got the right image but when you're developing this part the other hint is to actually change the address so instead of writing the main application area just write some dummy area so you can actually call it you can check it you can read back that memory through your in circuit programmer and check that it's actually written what you think it's written and only when you've got all that working you then just change the address to write the application main application area and then it's probably job done
Another minor hint is when you've actually finished the copy process and want to restart the main application, probably the best way is to um, turn on the watchdog timer, or obviously if the watchdog timer is running, force it to time out. That will actually force a hardware reset into your main application. Um, okay, you can jump to a reset vector, but one issue with that is that um, your program might be making some assumptions about the startup state of memory or peripherals, which won't necessarily be true, whereas a watchdog timeout or some, some uh, processes, for example, the PIC24s have an explicit reset instruction. You want to get as close to a hardware reset as possible. Obviously, another way is you just tend to sit there and you, you tell your customer just to power cycle the product, but um, yeah, updating the firmware and then just jumping into it, um, there are some sort of potential dangers, so I, I wouldn't recommend that. But one of the beauties of this is the development process is really easy and really quick. You know, you can have a really complex protocol that you're already de dealing with, um, but making that protocol able to do firmware updates yeah, involves a very, very simple, easy, quick development process. You don't have to, you know, stick your hand up the backside of a TCP IP stack to cram it into here, you, you know, you use it pretty much as is, and the only bit of code you need to write is something to copy data from your interface into the memory, which you've probably already got routines to do that, because you're already talking to those, and this is the only little piece of code you need to write, which is really small and then really portable across different applications, so um, just an idea for uh, alternate ways of doing things. I've implemented this on 8-bit picks, 16-bit uh, picks, I've done it on ARMS, I don't think I've done it on AVLs yet, but um, it's, yeah, it's pretty much my default way of doing firmware update dates these days. It just makes life really, really simple.